Welcome home. It's Irish Family History with curious news and notes. Celebrating our fourth year of this podcast at the Irish Roots Cafe, where every day's a holiday and there's always room for one more. One of six broadcast series from the head school at irishroots.com. I'm Michael Laughlin, your host, publisher of rare Irish books and uh, information on every county in Ireland since 1978. Be sure to read our blog, complete with links to click on from this podcast, and search our master index and books for free. Molly, wet the tea, Katie, bar the door, Sweeney, clear that floor, and bring out the Irish dancers. It's time we get this show on the road. Oh, well, we've got a good one today, folks. We're going to be talking about Irish DNA and a visit with an old friend. But just before we get to that, I'd like to say a little bit... uh, uh, I'm just now come out with a brand new book on Irish songs, singers, and uh, sheet music, and it's an illustrated history of, of of just that, as a matter of fact. And I think you might find it interesting. And I've got lyrics in there, plus I have musical notation and the history of the song all put together, and it matches up with the songs that we did on uh, the first year of the Irish Song and Recitation podcast. I just know you've listened to that and heard it, so. Uh, it's real good. You can have it just by itself or you can have it there and, uh, uh, view it and then turn to our podcast and hear the songs that we're talking about. And Hey, look at some of that old sheet music and that old design and, uh, look a little deeper into the meaning of some of these songs. It might surprise a few of us modern folks. Oh, and now it's time to visit with Bennett uh, Greenspan of Family Tree DNA. We've talked to him for the last three or four years, and he's always been helpful. So uh, we welcome Bennett to the Irish Roots Cafe and... Uh, we're going to ask you to explain a little bit about R1B and M22 and things like that, uh, Bennett. Well, for, first of all, uh, we can look at three different types of DNA that all of us have. We can look at the Y chromosome, which men receive from their fathers. We can look at mitochondria, which everyone receives from their mother. Neither of those two uh, biological units recombine. Therefore, a man has his father's Y chromosome, and that man's son receives his Y chromosome from his dad. The same thing is true on the female line, on the mitochondria side. And then we'll talk about the newest type of DNA testing, autosomal DNA testing, I hope later in the program. Now, to your specific question. On the male line, there's a tree of mankind, which basically shows how evolution has taken place within our species, Homo sapien. R1B is typically found in Central Europe and Western Europe, and the percentage of men who fall on the R1B branch increases as we move from southeastern Europe to northwestern Europe. The most common branch of male Y chromosome DNA found in Ireland is a, is the branch R1B, and a subset of R1B is a particular Uh, mutation known as a SNP, which stands for single nucleotide um, mutation or single nucleotide polymorphism. And the most common uh, mutational sub-branch of R1B found in Ireland is this branch called M222. And probably the most famous uh, uh, Irishman who is uh, or, or who we believe was M222 positive would be Nile, known as uh, Nile of the Nine Hostages, a 6th century Irish king from northwestern Ireland. Now, you know, some people say that in some areas, nine out of ten Irishmen are actually descended from that uh, king. 
Well, actually, R1B as a branch is sitting at about 90% in northwestern Ireland. But the interesting thing is that this sub-branch of R1B, known as M222, is found in about 1 in 10 men in northwestern Ireland. And that means that the king was rather prolific. Um, of course, you know, as, uh, as they say, it's good to be the king. Sometimes when you're the king, you have a, a better than average opportunity with the ladies uh, because the ladies' children then become princes who eventually can grow up and become kings themselves. And so it's not a bad thing to end up with the king. And so it looks like Niall and his father and brothers and sons were very prolific because we find this this Nile slash M222 branch, uh, very, very commonly in all of Ireland, but but even more concentrated in northwestern Ireland. Boy, and you know, there's another thing. If you're the king, you can eliminate a lot of the competition from the other men in the kingdom if you want to uh, through battle and maybe some other subterfuge. So that may be one more reason that uh, that O'Neill line had so many descendants in one area of the country uh, the king can simply eliminate competition if he wants to. Uh, isn't that right? That's correct. And that's that's one of the ways that a male lineage ends up being very successful. You either eliminate your competition uh, or you outcompete your competition. Now, what about the Norman origins and the Viking origins uh, uh, that we've heard talked about? I've actually heard some people say that the Vikings actually are found inland in Ireland, but not so much on the coast. Is that true? Well, I think I think it's uh, certainly as time goes on, we'll be able to uh, better ferret out Norman DNA from other DNA invaders uh, who came to you know, England and Ireland over the last millennia. Uh, but I think that to be very specific about that Norman DNA is probably a little premature. We know where they came from. We know what the typical DNA pool was from the place uh, that they came from. However, what makes it a little bit confusing is that bec before, uh, before the Normans uh, moved northwestward, they, their ranks had already been, been uh, uh, buffeted by Vikings who had been coming out of Scandinavia probably five centuries earlier. And so there's that combination of DNA that makes it a little bit more difficult to untangle. But as our database gets bigger and as more studies are done by academicians, all of this is becoming clearer and clearer to the benefit of of amateur historians such as ourselves and genealogists, again, such as ourselves. And so the nice thing is that science is advancing, and we as hobbyists will gain based on the advances that are being made by scientists. Now, I've read with some new studies coming out in Ireland, they show that the Vikings really aren't centered on the coastlines like we might have thought. They're actually centered in the Midlands, according to, to DNA, in the Midlands of Ireland. And uh, uh, that's sort of a new discovery. Have you heard anything? Actually, I think I had not heard that, by the way. I think that is, uh, is pretty surprising because typically uh, the Vikings came in their ships and landed and destroyed their ships and took on local wives uh, or local women as their wives and became farmers. But but. Uh, I think that most of our experience, at least in in Scotland, shows that that their numbers are pretty well concentrated along the coastline. And so, if in fact that same Viking type DNA, which is not R1B, but comes from a, lift, a different lineage, typically known as I1, if we're finding that in the center of Ireland. What that would indicate to me is that somebody pushed those guys from the coastline uh, into the center of Ireland, and there might be a few papers uh, that would be written on that subject trying to explain why a population would have chosen to move. When, uh, when these new discoveries come out or these new claims, how long does it take before you can really trust them or before you really you can really sit down and believe them? Uh, 
I know sometimes they end up being reversed, but uh, when you hear news like this, how long does it take to confirm it, really? I think that we're moving fast enough so that a new discovery uh, can be can be uh, uh, written about, and then another scientific team can look at the same basic data and offer their point or their counterpoint. And I would say that that whole process uh, generally takes two to three years. And so my, my guess is that, uh, that within the next couple of years, we should know a lot more about this uh, than, than we do now. And I'm not saying that we don't know a lot about it now, but you know, I'm, I'm one who believes that, that <clears throat> you should be careful with speculation and that you might want to hold back a few years and get confirmation before, you know, before something gets touted very heavily, just because it's always nice not to have to ever retract what you say. Well, you know, before we move on to the next uh, uh, part of our DNA discussion, I wanted to ask you about something, the, a topic that was in the news and uh, get your opinion on that. And that was, uh, you know what? I'm trying to think what it was I was going to ask you about a current topic. And uh, I can't remember what it was, Bennett. Uh, but, hey, but I know, I know you're going to help me out here. What was it that has just come up? I'll, I'll bet, just from the way you started that sentence, that you want to talk about the DNA of the Neanderthals. Uh, that's it. Thanks a lot for the help. <laughs> okay, so so this is very interesting because the Neanderthals come from an entirely different branch of of uh, uh, of Homo, which means that that they're not related to us for a few hundreds of thousands of years. They were the first explorers that left Africa that we have archaeological uh, data to, you know, to confirm that they actually left Africa and had dwellings in Asia and in Europe. And it's been speculated on and off over the last decade that there may have been some mingling between uh, between Homo sapiens, in other words, our species, and the Neanderthals. And this has been a pretty hot debate among archaeologists and among, uh, among uh, uh, molecular anthropologists over the last decade. About six years ago, Dr. Michael Hammer from the University of Arizona uh, said that he had found DNA in Southeast Asia, which was absolutely not typical of the DNA of, of Homo sapiens. And he speculated at that time that there had been some successful commingling between Homo sapiens and Neanderthals. But the latest information, not that it's uh, yet 100% verified, but the latest information we have shows that this mingling may have actually taken place much earlier, and there are some speculations uh, based on based on some scientific evidence that seem to show that all of us have a little bit of Neanderthal DNA, maybe one or two percent, and in some places on the planet, that overlap or that commingling could be as high as three or four percent. Now, what I can tell you is that we have never found a Y chromosome which doesn't fit on the tree of Homo sapien, which means that if there was mingling between Neanderthals and Homo sapien, that that the that the direct male line uh, did not survive uh, over the millennia in our species. The same thing can be said on the female DNA side. We've never found any female's DNA or anyone's DNA that came from their mom's side, which we could not place on what's called the phylogenetic tree uh, on the female side, which means that the only place that we're finding DNA that's odd or unusual is in the autosomes. And the autosomes are, uh, reflect your first 22 chromosomes. That's the DNA that recombines in every generation where you get some from mom and some for, from dad. And so what that would tell me is that that the ultimately that the mixing that took place between uh, between us and and our distant cousins the Neanderthals, if in fact it happened, was on a minor level, and there was no major um, 
uh, input from, let's say, strictly Neanderthal men, because if that's the case, we would be seeing a Neanderthal Y chromosome show up somewhere on the planet. And we've tested, you know, Mike, about 550,000 people from all over the world since we started doing DNA testing 10 years ago. And as I said, every one of those Y chromosomes fits onto the male tree. So what that would lead me to believe is that the contact between Homo sapien and the Neanderthals was minor and took place a very, very long time ago. And as it turns out, for one reason or another, there are just no Y chromosomes from the Neanderthals that have survived in our species. However, I'm certainly willing to keep testing people to see if that you know, if we ever do find a Y chromosome that's off the charts or female DNA that's off the charts, if that would be the case, that would make headlines. Well, boy, it sure would. That's autosomal DNA you were talking about earlier. That's interesting. That's the non-sexual DNA. And uh, talking about preserving things, can we preserve our DNA for future analysis or do we have to use it all up just when it's tested? Well, uh, you know, we we preserve DNA to be able to reuse it for our customers' benefit, and we don't ever run our customers' DNA for anything that they haven't asked us uh, to run it on. Of course, as a commercial company, that makes a lot of sense because you know we're not very interested in you know in in just testing for the sake of testing. However, uh, academicians once they collect samples from New Guinea or Borneo or Malaysia or Southeast Asia or Europe or, or anywhere on the planet, they will preserve that DNA specifically to look for scientific information. And so I would imagine that now after there has been a paper or two written on the Neanderthal DNA, that many scientific teams from around the world who collected DNA samples years ago are now looking at different ways that they can test that DNA to see if they can in fact find evidence of Neanderthal DNA running around in our genes. Well, let's talk a little bit about mom's DNA now. For a long time, we've known about Y DNA and you have to test the male line, that's the guy line. But what about mom's DNA? Can we do a female DNA test and and what can that show a genealogist? Well, you know, female DNA, of course, uh, you know, there there are approximately 6 billion people on our planet and all of them have the female DNA of their moms. There are uh, there are 3 billion males on the planet, and so female DNA is twice as common as male DNA simply because this female inherited mitochondria is in everyone, whereas the Y chromosome is just in the guys. However, because female DNA changes or mutates much more slowly than the Y chromosome, uh, over the past, female DNA was really good for anthropological purposes. It could show you your lineage's migration path out of Africa, for example, but it really wasn't very good. Yes. Now, now is it true that you do DNA testing on the female uh, DNA to get anything out of old things like mummies? Well, typically they do go back uh, uh, when they test mummies. They typically look at the female DNA because female DNA is not what we call nuclear DNA. Think of it this way. In the center of the cell, you have the nucleus and you have what's called nuclear DNA in the center. But there's only one copy of each of your 23 chromosomes in the center of the cell. Outside of the center of the cell, you have the mitochondria, which provides energy for the cell, and there are hundreds of mitochondria per cell. Therefore, if we obtain DNA from a mummy or from you know, someone who died and, and ended up in a cave or from the Iceman or Cheddar Man, who I just mentioned, uh, the nuclear DNA has probably past. It's probably gone because, uh, as I said, in each cell, there's only one Y chromosome and one chromosome number one, one chromosome number two. But in each of those cells, there will be hundreds of mitochondria. So if we obtain DNA from something that's ancient, the likelihood of finding nuclear DNA is very small. But 
because there are hundreds of mitochondria in each cell, we have a much greater opportunity to find some DNA. And what typically is the DNA that we end up finding is that, is that female inherited mitochondria because there's so much more of it to begin with. Now, what I was mentioning earlier is that in the past, mitochondria was really looked at as an anthropological tool. However, a few years ago, our chief mitochondria scientist suggested that we might want to offer people to look at their entire mitochondria molecule. The mitochondria is very small, only has about 17,000 locations in it, whereas, for example, the Y chromosome has about 50 million locations in it. So what we've started doing is we've started running the entire mitochondria molecule. And because we're looking at all the data on the mitochondria, we can use that genealogically. And we've actually done that a few times in some of these whodunits to prove that someone was closely related to someone else because they had the exact entire mitochondria molecule. And so the good news is, is that we have figured out a way to use mitochondria genealogically, but, but you have to run the entire molecule. You can't just look at one or two sections of the mitochondria if you really want to use the mtDNA, the mitochondrial DNA, in a genealogical fashion. Well, now you know the question I get most often is, okay, if I get my DNA tested, what is that DNA test really going to tell me and how close is it? Well, if, if you were to get that test and you were to look again at the entire mitochondria molecule, the likelihood is that two people who have the entire mitochondria molecule identical, uh, you're probably looking at two people, those two people sharing a common female ancestor in from, let's say, seven to 15 generations. So it might, you know, your connection could be uh, as little as, you know, 150 years. It might go back 350 years. Uh, but that is specific enough to help people draw conclusions. And of course, that's what we're trying to do with our DNA testing business. We're trying to help people rule in or rule out connections to other people. Same thing we're doing on the Y chromosome, but because there's so much more data available on the Y chromosome, it's always been much easier on that side. And so we're kind of excited about that breakthrough on the mitochondria side. Well, now, after the X and the Y chromosome, the male and the female, so to speak, there's also the autosomal uh, research that you've been doing, and you've got a brand new breakthrough in that. Uh, what does that have to do with DNA? That, that is correct. That's a good characterization of it. Uh, and this is the latest uh, horizon. And actually, actually, it's working out very, very well because what it allows us to do is to compare two people's DNA who are related to each other, and we can tell those two people approximately how close they're related to each other. Let me give you an example. In my own family, and prior to the time that I started Family Tree DNA, I found some people in Argentina with the same last name as my great-grandfather, my mother's mother's father. And so when I started the DNA testing company 10 years ago, I reached out to those people in Argentina. I had to get a mail. I got a mail, and I also obtained the DNA sample from my cousin in California who had the same last name. In other words, he had the same Y chromosome. And I was able to prove, in fact, that the, comp that the family in the United States and the family in Argentina were related on the male line, but I wasn't able to determine how closely they were related. Were they, you know, were they second cousins or third cousins or fourth cousins to us? It was all speculation. So recently, I ran one of these autosomal tests, which we call the family finder, on my mother, and I ran the exact same test on a woman, not a man in this particular case, because with autosomal DNA testing, the lines, the direct lines of descent don't matter. 
we can use a male or we can use a female or we can use a combination of a male and a female and we can match them up against each other and the results of that family finder test showed that there was enough overlapping DNA between my cousin in Argentina and my mom for us to be able to pretty conclusively say that that my mom and the person in Argentina were second cousins, which would have meant that my great grandfather and their great grandfather were in fact brothers because had they been first cousins, the descendants wouldn't have shared the same amount of DNA overlapping because the DNA gets diluted down in every generation because we end up having a wife who contributes half of her DNA to the child's genes pool. And so we can easily calculate the amount of overlapping DNA and use that to predict how close the relationship is. And what this means is that we can now take a family and we can answer the question, are all the kids full siblings or are they half siblings? We can show an aunt, uncle, niece, nephew relationship. We can also take an adoptee and we can match up that adoptee with uh, someone in our database to determine if in fact they are related. A lot of adoptees who come to us have a suspicion that this was my father or this was my mother from my genealogical research. But if the lines of descent weren't exactly what we needed 10 years ago, those folks were out of luck. But today they can each do our family finder test and it will tell them whether they are likely to be half siblings or first cousins or second cousins. And that would tell the adoptee that he, he or she was on the right trail. Well, now where exactly can we go to get these new autosomal tests and the things you're talking about? Does everybody offer all of them or is, is it different? No, there's just a couple companies that offer this new um, uh, autosomal test. The reasons for that are number one, the, the chips to be able to offer this are only manufactured by a couple companies. The equipment is very, very expensive. Uh, the companies are pretty proud of these chips, uh, which means that the test isn't particularly, uh, you know, isn't particularly uh, inexpensive. Although we're we're hammering on the manufacturer that that we use, explaining to them that that the market certainly would grow if they were able to, you know, find a way to be more reasonable on the price of the chips. And we're pretty pleased with the fact that we've got the price of that test now under $300, which we think is from a genealogical standpoint and what you can, given what you can prove with it, um, is, is kind of approaching that sweet spot where most people who are really dedicated as genealogists can afford that one-time test. And we're adding a couple new components to that test. Uh, we'll be adding after, uh, uh, just in the first couple weeks of July, we'll be offering a percentage test based on the same results at no additional charge so that an individual would be able to see if they have, let's say, for example, Native American DNA running around in their genome. Because you know, the, the story is that, that in all probability, anybody that was in the United States since the 1700s probably has some Native American ancestry. And a lot of people come, yes, well, you know, in the early days, of course, the Irish were sort of looked down upon, uh, especially in America. And then the Indians, they were also at the lower end of the, the ladder, that's for sure. A lot of times when there was an intermarriage between the two, they called it the uh, Black Irish. That's correct. And uh, uh, the, the, they were really hidden from family history or they were looked down upon and uh, nobody wanted to find out. Right. Well, it didn't really become fashionable to to have uh, Native American ancestry until I would guess the 1950s or 1960s in America. Prior to that time, it was something that you talked about in a very hushed voice. And, uh, and so people may have had just a family rumor that 
you know, that your father's mother's mother was Native American, but it wasn't something that most uh, families talked about. But now people are interested in that. Sometimes we're able to make that determination by using the Y chromosome. If the man who's, were, who were testing's father's father's father was truly a Native American, we can determine that. We've done that in many cases. It's also possible if your mother's 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 mother was Native American, we can, uh, we can attain that information using the mitochondria test. However, if it was your father's, for example, your father's mother's father's mother who was the Native American, since that lineage is not straight, you can't determine that with the typical sex genes that we've traditionally tested for the last decade. However, by using the autosomal DNA test, we can determine whether there is, you know, 7% or 9% or 14% Native American uh, in an individual, and that'll give a really clear picture. One thing I like about this particular test is that because we're using this what's called a SNP chip and we're looking at hundreds of thousands of data points, uh, the confidence interval is really very high. So uh, the, the plus or the minus factor, which we're always concerned about in science uh, uh, many years ago on these types of tests, used to be plus or minus 10%. Well, today, the plus or minus is about 2%. So if we say that someone is 8% Native American, they might be as little as 6 and they might be as much as 10, but the question of do they have Native American DNA in their genome has been absolutely answered. Well, you know what? Just last night I was looking at some sheet music, and the name on that sheet music was when Barney Car Carney married Arowana. How about that? <laughs> well, and of course, the Irishman always got married to an Irish uh, to a to a uh, Indian princess, and uh, you know that's understandable. You'd want to always end up with the best, but. Uh, I wonder about, more seriously, what about ties to surnames with uh, female DNA or, or, or even the autosomal DNA? Uh, can you really link to surnames or, or is it a much, uh, a much vaguer thing you come up with? Uh, uh, what, where do you end up on that? Well, if we're talking about the Y chromosome, it's really very, very clear. If two men share the same last name, that means that they're common ancestor uh, is since the time that surnames have been adopted uh, in your particular part of the world. And that's pretty good in Western Europe. It's not very good in Eastern Europe because most of the people in Eastern Europe only acquired surnames in the last six or eight generations. Although when we get to Western Europe, uh, whether surnames in some countries have been around for longer periods of time, then, you know, then it can be very, very clear. Uh, it's not as easy on using female DNA because females lose their surnames uh, in every generation. And using the family finder test, what you'll end up with is you'll end up matching people who have similar chunks of DNA. We call those chunks haploblocks. But if you just think of it as a chunk of DNA that you have and that your first cousin has, it means that you and your first cousin had to have inherited that block of DNA from your common grandparents. And by testing enough people in the family, you can ferret out whether that DNA that's in common is from your grandfather one of your grandfathers or whether, whether it comes from one of your grandmothers. On the percentage test, um, it's pretty clear because we'll, we show you a, either a pie chart or a bar graph that shows which um, approximately the percentage of your DNA that comes from, let's say, Western Europe and or Eastern Europe or Western Europe and, you know, and uh, Native American or Sub-Saharan African. So in that respect, you know, it's really clear. What it doesn't tell you is it doesn't tell you which of your grandparents or great-grandparents gave you that DNA. But if you test one or two other of your cousins, depending upon whether they have 
a significant portion of, let's say, Native American ancestry uh, or African uh, DNA in their genome, you can pretty easily determine uh, where that DNA that you have came from. Now, I've even heard several people say that they've actually, uh, out of a big database, you know, they found that uh, their name came or originated from a specific village in Ireland. And that's really everybody's dream to have uh, either confirm research or find out uh, really just through DNA where their family originated. And uh, I find that's really pretty fascinating. That's exactly correct. And all of us over here on this side of the puddle are, of course, trying to find how we are related to folks on the other side of the puddle or if we're related to the folks that we think we are probably related to on the other side of the puddle. And that's why it's good that Family Tree DNA is a, is a worldwide-based business which gives us access to obtaining DNA not only from Irish folks in the United States but also from, you know, from other places that, that the Irish have migrated to as well as all that DNA that we'd love to get our hands on that's still in Ireland. Well, I know, and you know, it seems like the folks in Ireland aren't quite as uh, anxious to get tested. Well, you know, most Europeans are not quite as interested in DNA testing as those of us uh, in the Americas for a couple reasons. First of all, uh, whereas we in this country want to know where we came from in Ireland, most people in Ireland know very well where they came from. Well, that's right. Uh, prob- uh, the, the family's been in the same area for generations and the graveyard's right in the backyard. That's exactly right. And so the question mark that we have here in the United States isn't the same question mark that the folks have over, you know, in Ireland. And so, uh, and that, that holds true also for people that we find in Scotland or in Germany or in England or in France. Those folks know where they're from and they're generally not that interested in you know, in in answering the question that we're asking because they already know the answer to the question. The question that we're trying to ask is, how am I related to this, you know, to to people with my same last name uh, in Ireland? Uh, Because the Y chromosome may have already proven that you are related. The question is, how long ago were we related? And when the paper trail runs cold, then it's an opportunity to employ molecular biology to try to answer your question. And it's a whole lot less expensive, although perhaps not as enjoyable, to do a DNA test as it is to get on an airplane and, you know, and, and, and go on over to Ireland and start, you know, start banging on doors and asking questions. Oh, I know what the first thing I did was do that, got right on that plane and took a trip over. And I'll never forget it. It sure changed my life. But, boy, I guess we have to tell you thanks for updating us again. This is our annual update. You know, we've always appreciated the help that we've gotten from you. And uh, can you share a little bit, if somebody wants to get in contact with Family Tree DNA, uh, how they might uh, go about it right now? Sure. If anyone wants to contact us, they can find us on the Internet at www.familytreedna.com. Uh, if they would like to call us, our phone number is 713-868-1438. But probably the best way to easily contact us is just to send us an email to info, I-N-F-O, at familytreedna.com. And write your question down, and we'll get uh, it answered in a day or two. It may take a little bit longer if you an- ask us a question on a Friday, since most of us don't answer emails on Saturday and Sunday. But we'll certainly get back to you. Uh, and, and what I would like to emphasize is that in the past, we used to feel that DNA testing was a second a source of data. And most of my customers agreed that it was a second source of data. The first thing you do would be your classic genealogy and you'd uh, you'd putter around with that for six months or a year, or two years, and then when you got stumped, you'd get a DNA test. And I have to tell you that this that this industry has come such a long way in such a short period of time that many of my customers who used to say the last thing you do is your DNA test. 
they're now saying that for a newbie just getting involved in genealogy, they're now recommending that the first thing they do is a DNA test so that they can find who they're related to so that they can then uh, employ traditional genealogy to try to determine how they're related. And they're telling me that it's a lot more cost effective monetarily and time wise to employ DNA first than to employ DNA last because this way you don't waste any time walking down the wrong road. You find exactly who you're related to first and then you use traditional genealogy to determine how we're related. And they say that that gets an individual to the finish line a whole lot faster. And of course, since most of our customers are, are not 27 years old, they're more likely to be 72 years old. Using your time efficiently makes a lot of good sense. Well, here's another last question. You know, when you take a DNA test and you swab or whatever you're going to do, I wonder how long does that physically last? How long does that sample stay good so it could be analyzed? And are there special ways of storing it? And uh, uh, what have you run across that? Has it improved over time? And are you still using the uh, the very same kits that you started out with years ago? Or has that changed? Well, um, it depends on what kind of sample you're using. And I'm glad you brought that up. If you use the typical traditional Q-tip swab scraped on the inside of the mouth, uh, the DNA that is collected there is, is going to last for a while, temperature dependent. The warmer the environment that you leave that Q-tip swab in an envelope in, the sooner bacteria is going to start to grow on the Q-tip and that's going to eat up the DNA. However, the DNA kit that we use is patterned after an anthropologist field kit. We have a typical scraper that's like a Q-tip swab, but it has an ejectable tip, and you'll eject that tip into a vial which has a buffering compound that is specifically designed to stop any bacterial growth. And so if someone collects DNA using that method, and then they were to just leave that vial in their home for six months or two years, uh, the DNA in it should be absolutely fine for almost any DNA testing. And so in effect, our classic DNA kit is also a, a storage and preservation kit. Boy, that sounds interesting. I know they're getting better all the time and uh, it's getting easier all the yes, time. Yes, it can. Uh, I wonder, can you uh, uh, leave us with a parting comment or two that we can uh, uh, go away with uh, while we're pondering? Well, the only parting comment uh, uh, that I would make is that I really appreciate uh, all the emails and phone calls and support that we've received uh, from the Irish community over the last uh, decade, and that uh, I don't think that we could have been as successful as we have been without you. So thank you very much. Well, thanks a lot for all your help to the Irish and, uh, and really the whole genealogical community, and uh, we sure hope that you'll talk with us again. It'd be a pleasure. Well, that's it for today, folks. It's been Bennett Greenspan from Family Tree DNA helping us figure out our Irish DNA and uh, Hey, you know what? I'm going to be talking about that on uh, August 6th on a five-hour seminar I'm giving at the Dublin, Ohio Irish Festival. I do hope you'll be able to make it. I'm bringing all kinds of research books, and I'll be talking about Irish history and Irish family history and genealogy and research techniques and uh, how to do a family broadcast. I'll even record your family history and put it on out on the air for, uh, oh, many thousands of people to hear. So, uh it's a chance of a lifetime. I hope you can make it. That's the Dublin Irish Festival. I have a link in the blog. Thank you very much. That's all for today, folks. Joseph, warm up those pipes. Remember, we have a broadcast series on Irish song and recitation, on local history of the Irish in America, and on 2,000 years of Irish history, as well as on the counties, and something special coming up on Irish language, I hope. Uh, we've got all that and more at our head school at irishroots.com. And you know, we've been known to appear, exhibit, teach, and even sing for your special events. Be sure to book in advance if it's important. And write me at my American address at Irish Roots Cafe, Box 7575, Kansas City, Missouri, 64116. 
Leave a message by phone at 816-256-3360. Reach me on my webpage at irishroots.com. Skype me at the Irish Roots Cafe. Uh, Get me on MySpace, Facebook, Twitter, and Irish Central. Members foot the bill so they get first priority, but we're open to all. And by the way, a big thank you to all of our members. And away. Thank <laughs> you.